CataractCoach.com, and we're doing a routine case here. And there's an important lesson today, and that lesson is how do we judge the Capsorex's size prior to making it? And then even while we're making it, how do we monitor the size to make sure it's accurate? We know we want a five or five and a half millimeter Capsorexis so that we can overlap the optic for 360 degrees. Let me show you how I measure it. So again, in this case, which is an average eye, emetropic eye, axis length of 23, normal anterior segment dimensions, we make our main incision. Now use my Capsorexis forceps, which are marked off at two and a half and five millimeters from the tip. So that should be the perfect diameter and that should be the center of it. So with that in my mind, I now start tearing the capsorexis. Now I could stop at any point and remeasure, but I have an idea in my head exactly how big I wanna make the capsorexis. And we're finishing it up, and you can see it's just about exactly five millimeters. And that's what we wanted. Now why is it important to measure with these forceps? Because eyes come in all different sizes and dimensions. A very myopic eye with a very long axis length may have a very large anterior segment, a large white to white diameter. Differences in pupil dilation and iris position can also play a role. So you, you cannot use the pupil size or the dilation to judge how big to make the capsorexis. We need to measure it to have an idea. So I'm showing you a simple way of doing it. We'll do fake chop in this procedure. Fake a probe going in the eye, here comes the chopper, buzzing with the probe to fixate the nucleus, and we can chop and give ourselves two halves. There we go. And now rotate the lens, buzz in again, and we can break it up further with the chopper. There are newer devices. You can use a half million dollar femtosecond laser to make the capsorexis for you. There are also other devices that use electrical pulses, or plasma energy to make a capsule opening. Some people like to make a mark on the anterior surface of the cornea with a cookie cutter type device to give them a guide. There are new intraoperative devices that give us a heads up display and an overlay of where the rexicide should be. Do what you wish, any of those methods is fine, but try your best to make that five millimeter capsorexis that overlaps the optic for 360 degrees. That's gonna give us the most stable positioning of the eye well and the most stable refractive result. So moving this last little piece of lens nucleus here, or epinucleus, and now we're almost ready for the cortex removal. In this article, and if you're just watching this YouTube video, you should be going to cataractcoach.com to actually see the article because there are figures and diagrams and text descriptions which are not shown here on YouTube. So now removing the lens cortex, we'll finish up the case. In the article that accompanies this video, there is an example of a very large myopic eye, long axial length, and more importantly, large anterior segment with a large white to white and extreme pupil dilation. And again, we make a normal five millimeter capsorexis which we measure ahead of time, but it looks absolutely tiny in that eye. So look at the figures here and study that to show that really we can't just use the iris size or even the pupil dilation level to judge the capsular exercise. Filling our eye now, which is aphakic, we'll fill the eye with our dis uh, cohesive viscoelastic. There's the outline of the rex. You can see that quite clearly, that looks great. And we'll put our single piece monofocal acrylic lens in the capsule bag. So fixating the eye here, and then we'll deliver the lens inside the capsule bag. It's very helpful for young doctors in training to watch these routine cataract cases over and over and over again. Challenging cases are fun, but remember 90% of your day to day is going to be routine. There you saw the lens power is 26.5. So actually this is a smaller than average eye. This is a hyperopic eye, but it had a normal anterior segment dimension. So there we go. Lens looks great in a beautiful position. We'll go inside the eye, remove the viscoelastic. Underneath the eye well, to me is an important step. So we go underneath there, remove that viscoelastic, and then we'll center up the optic and remove the remaining viscoelastic from the anterior segment. 
What happens if you don't overlap the optic for 360? Usually not too much. As long as you have it overlapped for most of it, let's say more than half, 200 degrees or more, that's often enough to really keep the eye well in good position. You just have to be careful. You don't want the eye well to tilt in the capsule bag. So if you have Rexus overlapping only half or less of the optic, and half of the optic is tilted forwards, that'll induce a lot of aberrations, such as astigmatism. There may even be a little myopic shift as the lens moves anterior, and it could induce higher aberrations, such as coma. So again, sealing up our incisions here, we'll center that lens up, that looks really good. I like the overlap of the optic and the rexus. We can uh, sweep inside the anterior chamber, make sure there's no retained viscoelastic, and we'll finish the case. Thank you for watching, and make sure you measure your capsular rexus.